Uh, how's um, I was going to say Bristol Myers Squibb because I've written down the ticker symbol, but not Bristol Myers Squibb. How's the UK version of Bristol Myers Squibb doing, Steve? Uh, so my favourite Filipino stock, Bloomsbury, uh, has reported its uh, its earnings. So these earnings were due, um, well, they were actually for for the year ending in February, um, but there was a obviously a period of auditing, and uh, they have released them this week, and the market didn't take them very well. Um, I think. Bloomsbury's down about 5% on the week because they had a little run-up uh, to their release, which was yesterday, and then a fall off the back of it. So I'll um, I'll shoot through them and um, see what you think. Um, so Bloomsbury achieved uh, record revenue and profit um, in its 37-year history. Sales increased by uh, 79 million, which is 30% to 343 million. Uh, profit increased by 18 million, which is 57% to 49 million. Um, the growth is attributed to um, the diversification strategy across consumer and academic publishing. Um, consumer revenue growth was particularly strong at Bloomsbury. That was up 49%. This was driven mostly uh, or quite a large part by fantasy fiction. Uh, Sarah J. Mass, uh, her Throne of Glass series, the new book. And uh, it, they were well, they led to Bloomsbury outperforming the broader market. Uh, UK trade market was only up four percent. US trade market was actually down zero point three percent. So to grow up forty nine percent when the market is trickling along, uh, it's uh, good, very good for Bloomsbury. Uh, digital resources. Uh, they said that's still on track to reach its thirty seven million uh, pound target by twenty twenty seven to twenty twenty eight. That'd be about ten percent of revenue. And uh, non-consumer sales dipped slightly, but the uh, company remains confident in the long term due to the rising uh, global enrollment in higher education. They recommended a 25% jump uh, in the dividend. Uh, in terms of guidance, said this, this said that trading is expected to be slightly higher than current expectations. Uh, this is because they don't have a Sarah J. Mass title that will actually be re- um, releasing in this financial year. Um, I had a look at um, what they they're, what they're classing as current expectations, and they said that they would expect revenue to be about two hundred eighty three point six million, and profit before taxation and highlighted terms of about thirty five point four million. Now, what that shows you there is that Sarah J. Mass release is big for uh, for Bloomsbury. It adds huh, maybe sixty million to the uh, to the, the the top line. So. Um, if you're thinking revenue uh, last year came in at about 264 million, what you're looking at here is maybe something you could consider as uh, an extra good year, um, and then going back to maybe mediocre growth. So, did they particularly outperform the um, the UK trade market? Um, uh, yes. But was that because of one author's incredibly, you know, well-selling book? I think the answer to that is probably also yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of um, uh, financial performance, so they generated about sixty-five point eight million uh, pounds at year end in cash. That's up from fifty-one point five million. So they are turning on profit taps. Uh, cash conversion is now one hundred and ten percent from one hundred and seven percent. They've got an undrawn credit facility of forty million available. Part of this is uh, to be uh, it's there as a in case they need to acquire something. They have um, acquired about thirty companies in their history, so they're not they're not um, against an acquisition, but they do tend to wait for it to be the uh, the right company. In terms of a dividend, 10.99p per share. Uh, that brings the total dividend up to 14.69p per share. Um, that's a 25% increase, as I said before. And that's a compound average growth rate on the dividend of just under 10%. Um, they've given some pretty good highlights, though, of things coming up. So uh, they said that um, they've got quite a lot of um, new titles coming from established and new authors across various um, genres. Uh, one of the ones that they pointed out um, as quite a heavy risk was another Harry Potter style um, text lifted from Philosopher's Stone, kind of reworked into a book uh, thing going on. Uh, but also Johan um, Harry's new book is coming out, and that's about um, GLP ones. Um, uh, his previous book, Stolen Focus, is a is a pretty good book and is well worth a read. Um, and I assume this one will be will be just as good. 
they talked a little bit about this Bloomsbury 2030 strategy uh, that they've been talking about. And it essentially focuses on growth, um, on Bloomsbury's portfolio management, uh, on and on employee development, uh, that they want to be um, the leading independent academic publisher um, with a particular focus on digital. They want to go out and acquire some um, US businesses um, in the academic space with digital potential, and they, uh, they're they prioritizing discovering and retaining the high quality authors and and illustrators that they've been they've been using uh, up until this point and uh, lastly they wanted to be the best workplace in publishing um through basically through expanding professional development to the staff uh, and to do that they're going to continue to invest in intellectual property and digital channels uh, they're going to publish high quality and original content going to continue to grow the diversified portfolio across consumer and academic divisions and they want to expand uh, further internationally to bring in revenue streams and income from um, around the world so they were very keen to point out steve that they still have six books uh, six more new books with sarah j mass so um should the series continue to um attract the attention that it has um it will you know there are six more unexpected years for bloomsbury ahead um, if they ever get two out in a financial year, um, they're probably uh, going to do in- incredibly well. But I would expect these books to take a little while to come out. I would expect maybe one every two years. So maybe that's what we've got to expect with Bloomsbury going forward as a shareholder. We've got to expect stellar years and then some less stellar years with with mediocre growth. Maybe you're comparing in two-year cycles rather than one-year cycle. Uh, maybe that's what happened. Maybe that's because the Sarah J. Mass books are so popular in comparison to their um, you know, their broader spectrum, which makes me think, Steve, perhaps um, this is another company very, very high on the someone-should-acquire-it list, somebody who uh, can smooth out the earnings and, uh, and uh, you know, looking at something like Sarah J Mass thinking um she's an incredibly successful author selling a hell of a lot of books i'm sure somebody would want that under their umbrella um maybe some kind of uh somebody who would want to license that out to you know one of the large digital content um creators um i think that would do really well but yeah it, to me steve this looked it was a disappointing reaction to me because um, there was a lot of excitement as this report was was coming out, and I thought the market took this really, really badly. And I think there was a lot of short term, uh, well, short term is a minute, and you can see why companies, you know, come out putting growth up like this and going down eight percent is is not a good look for the UK market. And I understand that the guidance is, you know, a little bit weak, and perhaps you're seeing a little bit of concentration here. Maybe if Sarah J Mass the next book isn't very good then that is a that is a, an issue for bloomsbury to try and solve um but the likelihood of that steve i think she's got a, a huge following now i think she takes a lot of care in writing these books i've got a couple of them on my, on my shelf to read this summer and um she seems to be really well loved the, the reaction to her books are very very good and the last one was very very good so we have another in with cracking sales and the bigger the library gets steve the more people you draw in um the more people have to buy 16 17 books just to get you know get back up to speed it does become a a virtuous flywheel um but it all depends on whether these books remain to you know remain good books but steve this is one that you own i believe for um a family member or a godson um do you still own this one I do own this, but only for, yes, a uh, godson based on the loose fact that he likes books. Um, This is from about a year ago now that I uh, own this, so I thought Bloomsbury would be a perfectly fine choice. Um, I walked past our local uh, Blackwells um, the other day and and Sarah J Mass in the window jumped out at me uh, and I thought of you when it uh, it did. It's always interesting the way we think about these kind of um, real stellar intangible assets things. It feels like you'd always rather have them than not, right? Um, A bit not dissimilar to sort of Google search and then we sort of start complaining, oh, it's a wildly undiversified business. It, It hangs very much on the on this particular one thing and how well this thing can do. And like, well, all right, fine. But if they didn't have it, you would be complaining that they hadn't got it. Um, I think this is a case of um, being pleased that you've got it and, and looking for the bonus when it comes rather than thinking, 
gosh, we are very much a hostage to the next Sarah J. Mass thing. Because uh, I agree with you. I don't think this is an accident here. I think this is uh, a pretty durable kind of intangible here. And, and you mentioned the numbers kind of going forward for about 35.4 million. This is a stock with a 440 market cap. That was in uh, either operating income or pre-tax. I can't remember uh, which one you said. But sort of think 35.4 uh, million on 440 gets you to about 12 times pre-tax earnings that's not terrible uh by any means it has a a bunch of better than average intangible assets here um and a dividend that's growing pretty well its balance sheet looks very strong too i don't see there's any kind of real huge danger uh with this i'm a little bit more kind of um wary on some of the other things i think i've mentioned before i if i were bloomsbury I'm not sure I'd be trying to fight in the kind of academic publishing area. My kind of knowledge of this or my understanding of this, and I say this as someone who has published a book with a non-academic press, i.e. not something university press. Uh, It's not Bloomsbury. Uh, In this case, it's actually Routledge, um, who were rolling up quite a lot of stuff uh, recently, but that is very much seen as... Depending on how fine grained you are about tiers, it's very much second tier behind most of the university presses. I mean, in philosophy where I work, kind of OUP is out on its own, to be honest. And then there's there's quite a lot of daylight, and then it's Cambridge University Press, and then there's quite a lot more daylight, and then it's a whole bunch of other university presses, and then there's even more daylight still, uh, and it's your Bloomsbury's and your Routledges and all the other uh, stuff as well. So I probably wouldn't be looking to. I don't know. I wouldn't like to see Bloomsbury focusing their attention there uh, too much. If they could grab hold of some decent journals, there might be some uh, some good value to be had there. But on the whole, I think they aren't a press that carries much clout there. They need to find an author. If you could convince an author to write something for that press that the name would sell, then that would work. I'm, I'm a bit more dubious about them as an academic publisher. That said, um, acquisition-wise, it feels to me like There could be a potential for an acquisition opportunity, a bit like the way it worked when Diageo was formed sort of ages and ages ago. So it was formed from two companies, one that was Guinness and one that was basically a whole weird bunch of uh, things. They owned, I think, Smirnoff or something, plus like Burger King, plus um, Pillsbury, plus some other food things. And they sort of agreed to join if you kind of um, kicked out all the food brand stuff and we'll just merge the drinks arms uh, for Diageo. Good, another good example is actually BHP and Anglo at the moment. BHP are saying, um, get rid of your South African subsidiaries that we don't want. Uh, you have a year or so or 18 months, I think, to spin them and then we'll merge. Uh, basically, I can see someone being uh, saying along the lines of, we will take this part of Bloomsbury's uh, business that we think we can license out, as you rightly say, to a kind of... Nice content creator here. All your Sarah J. Mass stuff, your Harry Potter books and so on. Um, keep all those things. Send all the other stuff somewhere else into a, um, a WK Kellogg type business that can go and float off and do its own thing for a bit where we're, we're less kind of enamored with those. But they've definitely got, as you rightly say, some assets there that are very clearly valuable. Um, and it doesn't have a big market cap uh, for the whole thing. And it would probably have even less of a kind of price if you were only looking to buy part of this thing. But you're you're right. I mean, if I were, well, I sort of am. I hope for my, for my godson, uh, I guess. I wouldn't like to see them get acquired. I'd like to see them keep going uh, as they, they are here. It's tempting to think. I'm sure they'd get a decent price if they were acquired because they're not that expensive and they're, they're a very acquirable size for somebody. I'm not quite sure who I have in mind. Uh, I'll be honest about that. But... Um, despite being a kind of acquirable size, I'd rather see them sort of carry on as they are um, and uh, keep building on that, uh, that very impressive asset that they have. Yeah. Just looking down the list of authors now, um, Samantha Shannon was another international bestseller. She's got a book out this year. So potentially um, I think that comes out. Actually, I think that might already be out. I think that came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, but that might be another one that might just push the the guidance along, depending on how it does. It's the tenth in the um, uh, in the in the series, so be be interesting to see how it is. But just looking down this list, Steve, there's um, Gillian Anderson's new book um, coming out, which may do quite well. There's a new Hugh Fernley Wittenstall's book, How to Eat Thirty Plants a Week. Um, imagine that's quite easy. I don't really understand how big that book's going to be. Um, but don't let him in your house. Um, Tom Kerridge cooks Britain. Um, that seems like that might be 
you know, again, I think these are steady sellers. So I'm looking for companies, uh, looking for sorry authors here that are going to really push the push the the, the guidance up. And, I, and I, I'm thinking Samantha Sham and Johan Hari are probably the best two uh, on that list. But they're saying they're trading slightly above expectation. Um, whether that means you know two two ninety two ninety two in in terms of revenue and and maybe around twenty million in profit, um, that starts to look quite attractive quite quickly i think in terms of bloomsbury especially if by next uh, results they have some more sarah j mass news for the market um i think the market is cottoned on to how big of a part of uh, uh you know she a role she has to play in their earnings and if she has something lined up i would expect this to do quite well so it might be one of those years steve where we get to buy uh, Bloomsbury at a fairly flat and reasonable price um, with um, one eye on the future. You've been watching a segment from the Playing Footsie Show, brought to you in association with our favourite broker, Trading212. For the full version of the show, check us out on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you check us out on the link in description, there's a free share in it for you with Trading212 if you open a new account. Just use the code FTSE so they know we sent you.